hello everybody and welcome to this session. I'm Christina Patterson, I'm a writer and broadcaster. I write for the Sunday Times and The Guardian in the UK about culture, books and society and I talk on Sky News about politics and current affairs. I also have a book coming out in a few weeks called The Art of Not Falling Apart and it's about resilience really, how we cope when life goes wrong and one of the things I talk about in the book is how the arts and literature Oops. help to build our resilience, how they're a fundamental part of our humanity and you'll find a postcard about that on your chair. So last year I was invited here as a journalist to write about the whole conference. I also chaired an event, I think in this very room, on the importance of the arts in education. Now my background was in the arts before I became a journalist. I worked at London South Bank Centre programming literary events and then I ran a national organisation for poetry called the Poetry Society. So it's a subject very close to my heart. And sitting on this panel, there were, I think, four people speaking, and three of them were teachers shortlisted for the um, Global Teachers Prize. And one of them was a head teacher called Ronnie Chen from Hong Kong, who spoke about the importance of music and the arts in a way that just electrified the room, actually. I was practically in tears and I was chairing the panel, so it was a bit <laughs> embarrassing. But he talked about how the arts can touch us and music can touch us in a way beyond words, in a way that words literally cannot express. And for someone like me, for whom words are almost everything, that really struck me. When I was here last year, I also met an art historian and journalist called Alison Cole, who's sitting towards the back there. And Alison, like me, had worked at, at a senior level at the South Bank Centre and at the Arts Council, and she's now the editor of the Art Newspaper, which is the international newspaper of record for the visual arts. And we both felt so strongly that there was not enough voice given to the arts and humanities in education, that people go on and on and on about STEM and tech, all of which is very important, but it's the arts and humanities that are what make us human, you could argue. And if we don't give that to our young people, we don't have much hope for the future at all. So I programmed this event with this stellar panel today, and Alison has programmed an event tomorrow on visual literacy with another stellar panel, and one of the speakers, the very eminent artist and critic Michael Craig Martin, is sitting in the audience here. So please come back here tomorrow at 12.30 for that panel. One of the people I met last year was um, a teacher called Michael Mawaya, and um, he was one of the shortlisted top ten teachers. He's a dancer. He grew up in the, one of the biggest slum districts in Kenya, a completely inspiring guy. If you see him, um, go and say hello to him. I, I reconnected with him last night at the party. But I wrote a column after for The Guardian about this event last year when I got back and I mentioned Michael and I mentioned Ronnie Cheng, the other teacher, and that column has had 84,000 shares on social media, which is probably more than anything I've ever written, because it touches a nerve. And one of the reasons it touched a nerve, I think, was that it mentioned dance. And we're very privileged today to have Tamara Rojo here, who is, of course, one of the world's leading dancers. I wanted to get a full spread of the arts here, so I'm really thrilled to have Tamara Rojo, Paul Griffiths, who is a complicated creature who I will explain in a moment, <laughs> Sarah Churchwell, eminent writer and academic, Julian Baghini, philosopher and academic, and Ron Alvarez, who was one of last year's top 50 uh, shortlisted teachers in the world. You know, top 50 in the world, just take that in, that is quite something. <laughs> Uh, Kristen Madsberg, who was due to be here today, I'm afraid couldn't make it, but as you see, we've got a full and amazing panel, so uh, we're fine on that front, and it'll give us all slightly more time. 
So each of the speakers is going to speak for seven minutes precisely, <laughs> and, uh, and then we will open up to you for some questions. Because apparently they don't have panels at this event, um, <laughs> we can't have an actual discussion on the panel through some semantic thing, but we will have <laughs> questions from the audience, which will be very much like a panel discussion, <laughs> I think you'll find. So we're going to start off with Sarah, and Sarah Churchwell is a Professorial Fellow of American Literature and Public Understanding of the Humanities at the University of London, which is one of the longest job titles I've ever heard. <laughs> but no brackets, I think, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> She's the author of Careless People, which is about Scott Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby, and the many lives of Marilyn Monroe. She's written for a wide range of UK and international newspapers and magazines, including The Guardian, The Financial Times, The TLS, and The New York Times Book Review. She's often on UK TV and radio on programmes like Question Time and Newsnight, commenting on arts, culture, and politics. Her new book, out in May, is called Behold America, and it's a history of the idea of America first and the American dream, which I think we can all agree is pretty damn timely. Over to you, Sarah. Oh, thank you very much, Christina. Um, I feel like I should probably warn everybody, I've, I've got stitches in my mouth, which mean that I can't laugh. So if I seem very oddly to be <laughs> suppressing laughter, it's not because I, I want to somehow not uh, um, enjoy what my fellow panelists are saying. So I just thought, they went, why is that woman being so stern? Um, so I thought a little bit of warning. Um, thank you, Christina, for this invitation, and, and thank you all for coming here. This is my first trip to Dubai, and it has been... Um, uh, the, the revelation that I, I hoped it might be, and I certainly found this morning um, wonderful. Um, Simon Sharma is a tough act to follow, and he uh, said a lot of the things that I think about the importance of the humanities far more eloquently, um, and at much greater length, Christina, you'll be glad to hear, um, than, I'm, than I'm going to attempt. I just want to make a few basic points. As Christina said, I think I, I hope that my understanding of this is is um, what you've encountered as well. I feel like in public discourse right now, there's a great emphasis on the education of the so-called STEM subjects of science, technology, um, um, math, medicine, engineering, and nobody is denying the importance of those things. That would be ludicrous. Um, but. We, we have set up a false binary, I think, and what we hear is, certainly in the UK where I live, you might be able to hear I'm American from my accent, but I, I live in the UK, and we have, we have the, the, to me, very perverse spectacle of ministers of education actively steering young people away from studying the humanities on the basis that they are not useful subjects. Now this seems to me such a remarkably narrow-minded and foolish and short-sighted way of viewing the world. So that's the premise that I'm beginning with, that that is the political conversation that I keep hearing, the cultural conversation, that the humanities don't matter. And so that's what I want to engage with. It's a false binary, as I said. Nobody is saying that we shouldn't be encouraging young people to um, pursue STEM subjects if that's what they want to pursue. But um, my own belief is that you should encourage people to pursue what interests them, that they should be able to follow their curiosity and their passions where they lead them. Um, we don't know the outcome of any question, of any pursuit of curiosity or human knowledge um, before we begin. That's the whole point. So let people independently think their way through what interests them and encourage them to find thought on the other side. In order to have these kinds of conversations, I think it's useful to actually begin with a definition. What are the humanities, anyway? It's something that gets um, tossed around, and, and as, a, as a professor whose title is the chair of public understanding of the humanities, if I can't define the humanities, I don't deserve my job. Um, so when people ask, and people do ask me, what are the humanities? Um, I always say, there are many def definitions, obviously, but I always say that the sciences study the natural world, and the humanities study the human world. And I like that definition personally because it suggests the interdependence of the two. Obviously, there is no clear boundary or demarcation between the na we are natural creatures inhabiting a natural environment. We are, we are subject to physical laws and natural laws. Um, but we also create a human world in and around and through that environment. So we have to understand both, is my view. The other reason why I like the word humanities, even though sometimes people don't know what it means, um, is because it's a plural word. And it implies pluralism in, in, in its very, um, in its, in its, its very, the term itself means there are multiple plural subjects, multiple pl plural human topics and human societies and human cultures um, that we need to, uh, that we need to understand. I don't think personally that we can solve any of the challenges facing us as 
uh, as uh, the human race if we don't bring the humanities and um, the STEM knowledge together. We're not going to solve climate change without understanding the way in which human cultures interact with climate change. We will not solve conflict if we don't understand religion, if we don't understand language. We will not, un we will not understand, the, the, we will not be able to resolve conflict if we don't understand the history of regions and where those tensions arise from. Um, so all of those things come under the rubric of the humanities. So of course we must study those things. I also take the view, again, you know, Simon just gave us a master class on why history matters, so I'll just add um, two cents to that, which is that my view is that one of the reasons we have to study the past is because it's all we've got. Um, we can't study the future, we can only imagine it. And that's the, um, takes me to the, to the next and sort of uh, second and final um, uh, set of remarks that I, uh, or thoughts that I want to um, turn to, which I'm just pulling up here because my iPad just reversed itself. Um, the, Part of that argument about the, the utilitarian argument, the idea that the humanities are not inherently useful, um, tends to then uh, circle back onto the idea about what it means to be a productive member of society. And by that, most people seem now to mean how do you make money and how do you generate money for your society. And again, nobody's saying prosperity isn't what we're trying to achieve or that we're trying to spread. Um, and certainly inequality is something that we all know that we need to combat. And many people will tell you that the humanities are not the way to do that. Um, I was very struck by a story a few months ago, that some of you, weeks ago, I guess, that um, some of you might have seen. Um, a man named Bill Miller, who is an international financier, some of you may know or work with for all I know, um, gave Johns Hopkins University $75 million for an endowment in the study of philosophy. Now, this was a big enough bequest for the study of philosophy that it made a lot of headlines. But I didn't see anybody comment on the, on the, the simple fact that it, was, it is remarkable in this conversation about the supposed uselessness of the humanities that nobody mentioned the fact that somebody who studied a philosophy degree went on to become that kind of self-made billionaire who could give 75 million to a university. And he thought that philosophy was important enough to what he had done that he wanted to encourage others to pursue philosophy. And then people said, oh, well, he's just an anomaly, right? Okay, so, you know, there's Bill Miller, and he studied philosophy, but most people, well, guess what? George Soros studied philosophy. Carl Icahn, he may not be a role model for everybody, but he made a lot of money. Um, and um, he's one of Trump's advisors, if you don't know who he is, and he is one of the people supposedly um, the model for Gordon Gekko in, uh, in the movie Wall Street, the greed is good, Michael Douglas character. So I'm not saying he's necessarily somebody that we want to um, model ourselves upon, but for those who think that this is about making money, he studied philosophy at Princeton and he went on to make a great deal of money indeed. And that started me on a train of thought and I, I had a little look around and I'm just going to read out a little list and then one final thought and I'll stop. Um, Barack Obama studied political science and English literature. Hillary Clinton studied political science. Emmanuel Macron famously studied philosophy with the eminent philosopher Paul Ricoeur. I don't want to step on Julian's, he's the philosopher here, I'll let him uh, explain Ricoeur to us. Um, most of the British politicians who become leaders study a degree called PPE, which stands for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at Oxbridge and Cambridge. Theresa May, current Prime Minister, studied geography. Boris Johnson, current Foreign Minister of the UK, studied classics. George Osborne, the former Chancellor, studied modern history. Christine Lagarde studied English, labor law, and social law. Angela Merkel is the outsider here. She studied quantum chemistry. But what I want to suggest is that with, and, and I said earlier that it's a false binary to suggest that there's math and science on one side and the arts and the humanities on the other side. And that's because they converge. The more advanced you get in your thinking, whether it's in the arts and humanities or in math and science, the more you move toward the imaginary. What is advanced math? Imaginary numbers, irrational numbers. What is advanced chemistry or physics? It is the theoretical, it is quantum. It is what you can imagine. And it's true also, of course, for the arts and humanities, that as you move forward through it, you are move, moving more and more into an imaginary theoretical space. And that is where leadership comes from, that is where vision comes from, that is where creativity happens, that is where imagination happens. And it doesn't happen either in math or in the arts and humanities. It comes from advanced 
thinking through creative endeavor, through independent engagement with ideas, with questions, with the world around you. And that is one of the things that the humanities has always um, uh, supported and endorsed. And then a final thought on prosperity, and I'll, and I'll stop. This was a point I was much struck by um, in an essay by the eminent American writer Marilyn Robinson, um, whose uh, work some of you may know, and if you don't, I uh, commend it to you. She has a new collection of essays out, and she just pointed out that part of this um, uh, attack, to put it um, no less dramatically, certainly in Anglo-American culture, on the idea of a, what we call a liberal arts education in America. Now that is a misnomer, it's not a misnomer, but it confuses people sometimes because it sounds as if you're only studying the arts. But we're using the liberal arts in the 18th century sense of the arts and the sciences. So a liberal arts education could be biology, it could be physics, it could be. Um, and the, the idea of the liberal arts education is free, liberal in that sense, free roaming across knowledge, across the arts and the sciences to understand um, as much as you can about everything, um, as uh, omnivorously. Um, and uh, she pointed out that we are now in this utilitarian argument. People are saying that you can't afford a liberal arts education, that it's a luxury, and you need to have a useful degree, and then you can go on and become a useful member of society. And she said, she just had one of those little insights where you go, obviously. She said, whatever else can be said about the history of a liberal arts education, which has dominated certainly um, Western Europe since the 18th century, you cannot claim that it has not led to a prosperous society. It is, the, it is the educational model that has been used for centuries, and it has done nothing if it has not led to a prosperous society. So why on earth is that what we are attacking now and saying without any evidence that a more narrow-minded and utilitarian approach to training will actually create a better workforce? There is no evidence of that at all, but we have centuries of evidence that studying the liberal arts across the board and bringing science's humanities together is actually where we create um, all knowledge, but also how we create prosperous and secure societies. Thank you. I don't know if that's funny. Here, here is what I want to say. Thank you very, very much, Sarah. Paul Griffiths is CEO of Dubai Airports, both Dubai International, which is the world's busiest international airport, and Dubai World Central. Before moving to Dubai, he was chairman and managing director of London's Gatwick Airport. And before that, he spent 14 years working with Sir Richard Branson as a board director of the Virgin Travel Group. More unusually, he also plays the organ to professional level. <laughs> now, I had the amazing pleasure last summer, I heard him give an organ recital, a solo organ recital at Westminster Abbey of all places. Wow. Now, if you've ever been nervous giving a performance, <laughs> <laughs> Westminster Abbey is probably not the place to start. It was absolutely wonderful. And I was really intrigued to hear that, uh, that Paul was inspired to do that by a journalist, no less, the former editor of The Guardian, uh, Alan Rusbridger, who uh, taught himself piano. And um, I believe you emulated that model. Um, so Paul, which shows how we can all, from different backgrounds and work areas and professions, and journalism is not a profession, it's a trade, inspire each other in surprising ways. So I'm very, very pleased to have you here, Paul. You're the only one who hasn't made a very long journey because it's a <laughs> half hour drive from where he lives. So over to you. Thank you very much. Um, why am I here today as CEO of Dubai Airports? A uh, very interesting question I often get answer, asked. And really, actually, the other interesting question a lot of people ask me is, well, you've had a very unusual career journey. Are, are you an artist? Are you interested in humanity? Or are you a businessman and a technician? And I think the answer is I've been very fortunate to have um, a, a very interesting background. Um, started really with my best friend at school who said to me, do you want to come and join the local church choir? And I said, no, thanks. Not really interested in music. He said, you get paid for it. So um, I duly went along. <laughs> And um, at the first choir practice, uh, my friend said, come and have a look at the organ. And in the church was this wonderful machine. Remember, the world's first analog synthesizer was actually the organ. <laughs> and um, it was just amazing with all this complexity. And I was absolutely determined to learn. So at the age of 10, I, I started to learn. My father intervened and I think forced upon me what I now know 
as a, a false binary. <laughs> he actually told me that Bach to Carters would never pay the electricity bill. <laughs> so um, he said that, you know, you need to get a, a decent job. Go and get a job. And um, I said, no, I want to play the organ. I want to be a musician. I want to be a cathedral organist. That's what I wanted to be all through my teens. And he would have been absolutely delighted if I'd have got a job as a bank teller. You know, um, just going and, you know, get yourself a proper job, not something that's playing the organ or doing something. Interesting, he was actually a professional pianist, so I think obviously something had happened in his career to force him off that particular track. But the thing is, you see, I, I really do think that there are things in life that you follow because you believe they are the right logical choice. And there are things in life you follow because you're absolutely passionate about them. And I've been very fortunate because I've studied music and had a window into the world of passion and precision, I've been able to apply that in the professional world. And I have pursued my career with passion. And aviation and transport was another passion of mine. And as I've sort of progressed through my career, I've had some quite remarkable and inspiring people to work alongside. Uh, Richard Branson was one of those. Um, I first met him in 1988 when he just started Virgin Atlantic with one aircraft. And one of the things he was known to say was definitely not from um, a business perspective. You know, with one aeroplane, we're either going to have the world's best safety record or the world's worst. <laughs> Let's just see how it goes. <laughs> Fortunately, it's the former rather than the latter. But the thing is, you see, I don't know if, if many of you here remember what flying was like in the 80s. Um, there were rules to homogenize airline service so airlines could make money. Do you know that um, there was a big row in the early 60s when Air France started serving food on board that was, of course, better than <laughs> any other airline. And the International Air Transport Association at that time brought in rules to dictate what the composition of a cheese sandwich <laughs> should be to stop the French from providing food that was better than anyone else <laughs> in the world. How ridiculous is that? So airline service, pricing, the whole thing was fairly horrific in the early 80s and it took someone with vision and passion to actually start a service revolution which put the human at the center of the business proposition. And of course, I think Richard Branson was quite instrumental in changing a lot of perspectives about what service is all about. And I think another reason, this wonderful phrase, which I hope you don't mind that I'm going to uh, shamelessly plagiarize of, of creating these false binaries, is why should business eliminate the passion of humanity? And actually, if you think about it, forcing people into technical careers where they are just seeking to find the latest computer technology for a solution is going to have an interesting consequence in my view. And in my everyday life, I see this. Because what we're trying to do now as an airport is recognize that technical development will have a vast role to play in eliminating very poor processes. When you arrive at an airport, you have to queue up to check in and deal with your baggage. Then you have to queue up to go through security. Then you have to queue up to show your passport. You know, the problem is with airports today, they have queues as a fundamental part of their product. And the only two places in the world where you queue today are the post office and the airport. <laughs> And what I'm now determined to do, absolutely, the ladies' room, but I wasn't going to go down that particular road. <laughs> That's predominantly in America for reasons which I do not understand. Anyway, the thing is, you see, I'm desperate to use technology to eliminate all of those incredibly poor processes. And that's the way the technical revolution is going now. Because I'm determined to be able to hand the monopoly on queuing back to the post office. <laughs> but the thing is, you see, what does that mean for young people today? It means if they pursue a career in science and technology and we actually converge in producing better process 
better ways of doing things, actually the world is going to be quite a homogenous place because good technology and good process, look at driverless cars, is all about creating a common solution and a common network. And we need that ingenuity to get there. But what's going to happen once we've got there? And we've recognized in the airport world, once all the processes have, have gone into the background, you are left with the humanity. And what we've learned very quickly is people don't like being served by machines. That's not the way that the world is going to go. Humanity prefers to be served human to human. And bringing that passion back into the service industry and creating processes which enable more people to interact with others will be the key differentiating factor in the future. So my view, I think, is that I've been very, very fortunate in my background in music and the arts to appreciate what good human precision is all about, what passion can be unlocked by sitting at the front of an orchestra playing the harpsichord for a great Bach passion. And that is the idea that's really driving me in business. How do we bring the humanity back into that frontline service model in front of our customers? So my view, there is more of a future in bringing back human interaction and technology will facilitate that. So anyone who argues just to have the disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics just as the key skills for humanity is actually leaving out that passion. Passion is something that's individual, it taps into emotion, it drives people to want to be different. History has got plenty of examples of that and I believe that will be fundamentally a core skill required for both business and for the future of the human race. So I really would urge people not to turn their back on the arts and bring that right into the core skills that we will need today and tomorrow in every walk of life. Thank you. I think we've kind of made the argument already, but we'll carry on and hear more of it. So Tamara Rojo was appointed Artistic Director of the English National Ballet in 2012. She combines this role with her dancing career, performing as lead principal with the company. Before that, she was principal dancer with the Royal Ballet. She has a PhD in performing arts from King Juan Carlos University in Madrid. She's won many awards for her work, most recently a CBE for her services to ballet. Now, dance is sometimes, for incomprehensible reasons, regarded as the poor relation in discussions like this. But dance is absolutely vital, and Tamara Rojo is one of the world's most eloquent spokespeople for the art form, so I'm really thrilled to have her here. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, when Christina asked me to be part of, of this forum, and I saw who else was in this forum, I thought, well, we're all going to have the same opinion, so we're probably all going to say the same things. And, and I fear that's the case, that I'm going to repeat <laughs> many things that have been said before. Um, the other thing that I feel I need to disclose is that I hate speaking. Um, I, I genuinely do, not just publicly, in general. Um, and I was really very lucky, because when I first entered a school, um, that was a nightmare to me, an absolute nightmare. I was an only child. I think I had probably a huge world inside my head. And the forced interaction with others um, was something I really feared. And dance saved me. Dance and, and the discipline of, of ballet and the, the environment of, of quiet study of your own physicality and your own emotions was a window into my own emotions and a way for me to express myself. So I always feel that not only arts are good for society, but they are good for the individuals that don't quite fit. Um, but let's um, try and, and, and speak about some of the more pragmatic things maybe that we can use to explain to those that don't agree with all of us here why we need the humanities. Um, 
one of, of, of the things that I think are uh, the better ways to, to explain to, to those that don't agree is that studying the arts have been proven to be beneficial, um, have been proven to have a beneficial impact in academic achievements in schools. And there are plenty of studies that prove this, but one of my favorite ones is the one by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They develop a program to teach maths to women, to girls, between 12 and 13 through dance. And according to the researchers, math, like dance, is a universal language that allows us to express enormous passion and creativity with utter precision. And success in both fields requires confidence, dedication, and attention to detail. And the wonderful thing is that the girls' improvement was 273% improvement in math and over 100% in confidence, which for me is even more important, all due respect to maths, but for a young woman to just feel confident about herself is, is quite uh, wonderful. And further to this, Dr. Fabiola Gianotti, the first female director of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, who happens to also be a pianist, said that the rigor and the precision and the creativity that she learned from her music studies were as important as her physics studies for the job she does today. So just from a practical level, if you believe in the importance of STEM subjects for education, just include the arts, because the results are gonna be better, even if you don't believe in the arts. <laughs> um, I also work in Britain, so I, I am joined in the political um, dialogue that is happening there about EBAC and STEM subjects. And Nikki Morgan, in her addressing to the, um, in, um, to the Creative Industries Federation in July, Nikki Morgan is the Education Secretary uh, for Britain. Former. Former, former sorry, mm -hmm. she's been fired. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. Um, she said, uh, that she believed that access to cultural education is a matter of social justice. And I said, I agree. Let's see what happens next. Well, the thing is, in the UK recent reforms by this same government, the focus on EBAC and the complete real scrapping of subjects, of our subjects in the curriculum, doesn't seem to go together with this belief. Um, in fact, there has been a reduction of 12.5% of students taking any art subjects, a 17% reduction in hours dedicated to the arts, and 9 in 10 schools are cutting art subjects altogether. This, for me, is not only a mistake, but a social tragedy. Because for many students, the only and first point of contact with the arts is the school. So, Especially in Britain, when you have all these different cultures in London where we live come together, that what point of joint cultural understanding in the school is disappearing. Um, we know that the arts are essential to the works of tomorrow. They give you creative vision, entrepreneurial skill, and artistic flair. And they will have the transformational advantages that, that, that derive from study art, they will have incredible value on the, on the workforce of tomorrow. Um, there is also, obviously, vulnerability. When you study the arts, there is no clear answer. You need to put yourself in a position where you have to analyze what is in front of you. We have to create the muscle of intellectual analysis and understanding. And that, as a person, makes you grow, and hopefully makes you understand others, makes you feel more um, um, empathetic, like in the first um, speech was said, um, and, and, and also cope with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the future looks rather uncertain. It, it certainly looks uncertain from the workforce point, point of view. So who will want to send their students out to the world without the skills to be able to deal with uncertainty? Um, the other point that has been said today is also that we, or there is a, a belief 
that those that study the arts will make no money. Well, <laughs> there is some truth in that. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but there is also truth, like it's been said, that many of the most successful um, people in the world have studied humanities. And one of the most painful truths, I think, that is happening now in Britain, for example, is one of the best ways for social mobility, but of the best way for the working classes to have aspirations beyond their economic class is in the arts. So by scrapping their subjects from the school, not only are we depriving them from the experience of art itself, but we're taking any hope of social mobility away. I'm aware that I'm running out of time. Um, so I'm just going to um, just go to my final point, um, which is that you know, if we think that the future um, is going to rely on artificial intelligence in robotics, if we all agree that we do need um, to give our students uh, access to the arts, access to the humanities, we cannot just talk about it. We have to organize ourselves. I'm very fortunate that I am involved with the Creative Industries Federation in the United Kingdom, which globalizes or puts together those organizations for profit and non for profit. Let's not be ashamed of that. Some organizations, cultural organizations, make a lot of money. Let's work together and make our case for those that can make policy, for those that can make change. My only ask is that when we all go back to our countries, we think, can we all do this in our own backyard? Can we create our own creative industries federations? And can we link together? Can we have a, a global conversation about the importance of the arts, of the creative industries, of humanities, for economic reasons, for social reasons, for cultural reasons, for financial reasons, whatever reasons you think is going to work to convince your local MP, your politician, your, your government, and let's work together. Let's start being proactive and make change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara. Uh, so Julian Bagini, I just had a note to say from Julian to say that I mispronounced his name, which uh, I've always, the weird thing is, I've always known of him as Julian Bagini, and then somebody yesterday said Julian Bagini, and of course, as a girl, I instantly assumed that for the last 20 years I'd got it wrong. So, anyway, uh, Julian Bagini is one of the UK's most eminent philosophers. He's written and edited more than 20 books, including The Virtues at the Table, The Ego Trick, Freedom Regained, and most recently, A Short History of Truth. He was the founding editor of the Philosopher's Magazine and has written for many newspapers and magazines, as well as for think tanks like the Institute of Public Policy Research, Demos, and Counterpoint. He's also, intriguingly, appeared as a character in two Alexander McCall Smith novels. <laughs> His website is called microphilosophy.net, and do look it up. Julian, thrilled to have you here. I know you haven't had all that much time, but uh, go ahead, please. No, well, it's been very stimulating, thankfully, so I haven't had a chance to uh, catch up on sleep this morning. Um, I, there is this danger, we pointed out, that we'll all end up saying the same thing, and I think I want to try and actually introduce an element of perhaps not disagreement as such, but try and sort of get a slightly different angle. I agree with everything that's been said so far, but in a way I think uh, there's a danger here that uh, we're, we're talking about it in, in the wrong way. There's this story you may have heard, it's attributed to many people, the original version seems to be an anonymous soldier. In, in 1914 was um, criticised for not enlisting in the army to fight the enemy and, and this person was an artist and his reply was simply that he was the civilization they were fighting for. <laughs> now, on the one hand I think, you know, that, that no one is kind of exempt from having to do their duty when the backs are to the wall. But behind that kind of excuse was a serious point, really, which is that, you know, actually, you know, the, the arts and the humanities and the sciences as well, and the non-instrumental side, are the, you know, the greatest flowers of civilization, and that's what we're all in this for. And they don't need defending in terms of anything else. And I think what happens is we get sucked into a kind of debate in which we're always having to justify the arts and humanities in terms set by a more utilitarian agenda. And so, and, and, and 
for, that case could be made. We've heard various versions of it. This morning, Mohamed Simade argued that, you know, politicians, he complained, didn't invest in education because they didn't see the economic return. And he believed there was an economic return. We've heard various people on the panel today pointing that out. That's true. And that's fine. And I think that's all very well. And it may also be the case that a good uh, education and, uh, and even music and dance can help your performance in other academic subjects. But I think the problem is, why are we always having to make the case for the arts humanities in terms that satisfy people who are putting the, the, who wanting the buck to stop with the buck, as it were? Because the buck shouldn't stop with the buck. The buck should stop with what makes um, human life most worth living. And, and this happens all the time to me. So, for example, recently I was involved in something that didn't quite get off the ground, which is a project on arts and well-being. And there's lots of money going into this, because, again, it's true, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of arts programmes, ones that involve participation more than just going along as an audience member, have all sorts of benefits for health and well-being, physical and psychological. But again, you see, what happens is I, I overstate that point, I think, and what you're ending up doing is this sort of creeping instrumentalization of the arts and humanities. It's encouraging this idea that it, it's, it's idealistic or a bit crazy to value them for their own sake. You've always got to value them for the utilitarian benefit they give us. And of course, in order to make this case, uh, every study now has to also have its obligatory little segment on the neuroscience, because that makes it real as well, okay? So if you want to show the value of the arts and humanities, um, shove someone in some kind of brain scanner and show that, you know, listening to Mozart does something to a bit of the brain which has some practical benefit. So I think, I think this is getting things completely uh, the wrong way around. It's actually ec economic growth is the instrument, a technology is the instrument, the, the aim and the goal is what we would want to call a civilised society. And that's something which it, where the arts and the humanities have their... Um, and play a very, very important role. And so do the sciences, by the way. I mean, I, I don't think... Again, I, I don't want to create this false dichotomy. And different people have different interests and skills. I think it's as remarkable that some people have spent their whole lives investigating the workings of nature as it is that people have spent their whole lives, you know, painting or, or dancing, doing choreography. I mean, these are, these are all the great fruits of, of human ingenuity and creativity. So I think you should sort of turn things around a bit, really, and, and be a bit more offensive and, and less uh, defensive in, in our case, and have a go a bit at the, at the people who are always trying to bring things back down to the practical. Um, Mo Zi, one of the um, ancient uh, Chinese philosophers, he was an outlier in... in classical Chinese philosophy. Um, he argued for a very early form of utilitarianism. He argued that you, know, you shouldn't have music because music requires a waste of resources. You've got to put money into instruments and all the time they're practicing, they're not you know, plowing the fields and doing all these really, really useful things. And in a sense, that's making plain the sort of logic behind the mindset which says that the only things that really value at the end of the day are those practical economic things. And the thing you have to ask yourself is, who wants to live in that kind of world? You know, that's not the world we, we, we want to live in. That's not what we put at the... the that's not our end goal. It's means to an end. And it's interesting here, as a thinking about... This is an education conference, and we celebrate teachers here, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Think of your most inspiring teachers. The most inspiring teachers aren't careers advisors, right? I don't think. Yeah, they, they can be. Careers advisors are important. I don't want to knock that. And often education is an important route into a career. So, again, I'm not knocking that. But the teachers that I think you most remember are the ones who touch you in some other way. Maybe it's that they touch you merely because they enable you to kind of realise your potential more. They give you the confidence and courage to go and do what you do. And then the end result may be a, a career which earns lots of money and therefore seems to be uh, of a utilitarian function. But actually... What makes them those great teachers is that they, 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 they do something for the, you know, what we call the human spirit, as it were, the soul. These are words which I, as an atheist, I kind of struggle with a little bit, but, you know, you, we, we know what we mean. And it's interesting, again, quoted this morning um, from Sheikh Zayed, the founder of UAE, the prosperity and success of the people are measured by the standard of their education. 
And I think that's kind of true. And the, it's the standard of the, of the education, meaning not the, the judge of the standard of the education is not how well that enables people to go on and earn money or to do practical things. That's a benefit of education. But the, the value of a society, uh, the prosperity and success of a society, I think, is the extent to which it's able to create a society where you know thought, culture, creativity, intelligence, curiosity, investigation are all flourishing. And if we've got that, we, we need a certain economic um, base in order to achieve that. But let's remember that the, the, the utilitarian element is what's enabling the more important thing, which is that more fuller human flourishing. Thank you. Very useful uh, twist <laughs> in the perspective there, Julian. It reminds me, when I was running the Poetry Society, I used to have to fill out annual forms for the Arts Council, and you'd have to kind of argue that poetry would improve people's employability and communication skills and all of this stuff. And of course, I had to do it to get the funding. But I really felt like saying, have you ever met a poet? <laughs> I don't think anyone would say it was the obvious spin-off. So last, but very much not least, we have Ron Alvarez who, as I said, was selected last year as one of the top 50 teachers in the world. His own life in Venezuela was changed by the famous musical and social program El Sistema. As a result, he became a violinist, conductor, teacher, and cultural manager. He's taught masterclasses around the world, including in refugee camps. In 2011, he founded an orchestra for Inuit children in Greenland, just 700 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle. And two years ago, he created the Dream Orchestra in Gothenburg in Sweden with young and teenage refugees, helping, helping them to integrate into Swedish society. This model is being copied in several European countries. My late mother came from just down the road from Göteborg, as I was brought up to call it, so I'm particularly thrilled to have him here. Over to you, Ron. Thank you so much. Uh, what's after all this speech is quite really hard to talk. <laughs> but one of the things is, um, Every time that I ask this, uh, have this question, uh, why we still need art, why we still need uh, humanities, and for 2030, I just think about my life. And I think about how music has been changed my life. And then thinking also uh, how music changed my life, but also how music has been changed the life of my students, and how music is can change the life of all new uh, students. So. One of the things is, I was born in Caracas, Venezuela, which is a really difficult city, and right now even more. I have the first contact with music when I was uh, around seven. Uh, I was in my grandmother's house, have a little uh, shop that she created just to sell uh, ice creams. And selling that ice cream after school when I was seven, I hear for the first time the name of Beethoven and Mozart. And I was curious to know what it was about. And I, my grandmother says, it would be nice if after school you can help me here to do work, but also that you do another activity. And I remember my first class as unique. And was exactly unique. And then I remember to read an article about Jack Mack who said, we need to teach something unique. We cannot compete with machine. We cannot teach the kid to compete with machine. We need to teach the soft skills. And that's what exactly I learned from the music. That's what exactly I learned from the music. Music gave me the way to, to be passionate, to work for my future and future of the others. Independent thinking, teamwork. And at the same time, Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu, who created the programs, is my mentor. He always mentioned uh, a quote of Arnold, uh, Arnold uh, B uh, Toyner, who is a historian. He said that we live in a Christ, a spiritual Christ. And then I think it's not about economic crisis, it's not about political crisis. It's about how we build our soul, how we build our spirit, how we can be uh, better and then my answer is we need music and art I must say music art and humanities are a requirement to have a good life 
you must have, at kids need to have access to art, access to humanities, access to music. For me, education is a, a, a path of multiple destinies. But when that journey includes music, as it was in my life, you, feed, you give to the kids many possibilities. Because music is, is peace, is love. But at the same time, it's life. I would like to uh, mention a quote there I read some time ago uh, about Platon. He said, I will teach children music, physics, and philosophy. But most importantly, music. For the patterns in music and all art are the keys for learning. And it is like this. I feel then when I was learning music, I was in an orchestra. Now they're teaching in a refugee camp, when teaching uh, in north of Greenland, or in any place in Kenya. I see the kids, and I can see that all of them are the same. They are kids. They are waiting for the future. They don't know what problems are around us. They just want to have the opportunity accomplish them dream and art is that opportunity to give them to express themselves for me music is a way is an instrument to have a voice because every time when we talk about music people say oh music is a universal language but we use universal language of what mm -hmm. of our heart of our soul it's a universal language to communicate each other even to I'll say anything I use music as, as communicate ballet dancers do by the body, others do by painting, others do by writing. But the most important is that all, all of us give that opportunity to the students and to the kids. I would like to, because for me it's really hard always to go to the stage and speak our teaching. I always need to learn and teach something. I've been learning so much from you. And I would like to teach you something very quickly and very easy. It will take me one minute. And it's actually about people say, because I'm a conductor for children, what the conductor does. Mm. Why, why this guy is with a little stick just there doing moving the hands? And actually, you are just a moderator. You help them to understand that the orchestras and the choir are community how they can respect each other, how they can learn values, how you can use music as a tool for values. And that's what I learned in El Sistema in Venezuela. And that's why I develop in many places. So very quickly, uh, can you imagine if you are in a, in a big, big house? Put your hand like this. And then you just decide uh, to go uh, to the laundry to make your wash, because that's normal life. Go down. And then after, uh, go to your left. Exactly. And then, and then you eat something, because that's important for life. That's basic. And then read a book to your uh, other side. <laughs> and then go sleep, because you need also to rest. They are important and basic important. So. Let's do an hour uh, quickly. Let's do quickly the same thing. But let's put passion, love. Let's put chain. Let's chain the person who is next to you with this movement. Or just doing laundry, reading book, and go to the kitchen eat. And do your basic thing that everybody does. So go down. Go to the uh, kitchen. Go to, uh, to read the book. And then go to your own. And now, let's do quickly with one hand. Put in front of your hand, go down, <laughs> go to the kitchen, <laughs> go to the room, and go to your own. And actually, you're already conducting. <laughs> because one of the things, and it's what I want to share, is through art, through music, we can teach what we have, we, who we have every day. It's nothing different. Give that opportunity to the kids. Give that opportunity to the children. 
we always talk about to make this world better and change the world. I don't think that we need to change the world. We need to understand the world. We need to respect the culture. And at the same time from that, learn every day and use, give opportunity of access to every kid with music, art, and humanities. And in that way, you will have a kid who can dream, who can conduct. What can conduct? Them dreams, them life, and share with each other because that's exactly what we need for 2030, for the, the education tomorrow. We need to give opportunity to the kids to have a voice, and that voice is, can be art or humanity, and especially in my life, music. I wish I'd been taught by you, Ron. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As the conductor of this session, I've been told we have now just five minutes because it was cut short by the plenary overrunning. So um, five minutes for maybe two, one or two, very, very snappy, sharp, brilliant, incisive, overwhelmingly genius questions. No pressure. No pressure. Answer, which I'm sure will encourage all of you. So uh, uh, yes, one there. Hi, my name is Laura from Madrid. I work in oh. So, yes, can you wait for the microphone, please? Yes, thanks. Um, my name is Laura, I'm from Madrid, I work and live in Dubai. Um, my question is, I, I believe that passion and creativity is in everything you can do. My question is, why is passion and creativity taking all the credit in, in art and humanities mm -hmm. and is put it in, in the shadow when it comes to all the disciplines? What could, could we do um, in, to, to, to help passion and creativity, we moved forward in all disciplines, not just art. Who would like to answer that one? I've got, I've got a brief comment. I think part of the problem is that there's a kind of a... Uh, we, we've got all sorts of very unhelpful false dichotomies in our culture. And, and one is the, the sort of science and reason are always portrayed as these very sort of mechanical, logical, cold processes. And then on the other side, you've got passion and creativity and so forth. And actually, I think you just, you just need to look and see that isn't the case. If you read any biography or group biographies of scientists and engineers, you always find there's this combination of insight, creativity, passion, desire, and then, of course, the, the rigorous logical testing and experimenting and verification that comes afterwards. So I think part of the point is just to see that, you know, the, uh, the thinking uh, well requires a whole range of things from the analytical and the logical to the creative and the imaginative. Can, can, I, can I just add yep, very, yep. very quickly to that? that it's, it's, and we're going to keep coming back to this idea of the false dichotomy because I think it's really important and that it's also one that works on the individual level. Think of somebody like Einstein who's also a musician. You know, Voltaire was a scientist and an artist. The great Enlightenment philosophers were Newton. You know, they were scientists and artists. Da Vinci, for heaven's sake, right? So that is a new false dichotomy. It's one yeah. we've created in our society and it's very much to our detriment. So it's just a mindset that, uh, to, in my view, we just have to get rid of it. It's, it's that simple, actually. Just eradicate it. Say, that's just silly. People <laughs> have to pursue what they are passionate about. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. And, you, and hopefully find clearly, a way to be clearly clearly not. Sarah, put your arms I'll stop. Sorry. No. I know. I'll, I conduct. <laughs> I should stop. Um, I think it's like one more question. Yes. But please wait for the microphone. Thank you. My name is Ingrid Stang. I'm from Norway. And I have one leg in the humanities and one in, in business. And, and it's really the same. And when we hire, especially leaders, we always look for people who have a different background than MBAs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, business people understand it. I think it's politicians who don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to yeah. know. Yeah. One more, because that wasn't exactly a question, but a very, very important point. Yes. Hi, my name is Daria. I'm from Mexico. Um, I recently graduated high school. Um, and one of the things that you know was a big problem, I'm really into humanities, but we are not allowed as students to explore creativity that much in humanities. You are set um, a set list of books you can read, poems you can read, um, things in music that you can explore, whereas in STEM, you are allowed to create whatever mm -hmm. you want, explore whatever you want. Yeah. So how can we, as students, as learners, fight against that and explore our own creativity within humanities. Who would like to answer that? Someone who hasn't answered the previous question. Any takers? 
Well, one of the things, um, and this happens all the time, is to give uh, freedom to the students to develop their creativity, but at the same time, to give instruction on how to find that uh, creativity to develop, to get the skill to develop their own creativity. Because you have the uh, kind of information and that knowledge how to take that creativity, then it's more easy to uh, like really engage that. So I think as a musician, I give tools to my students who can really help them to be a leader. And then that's why I teach uh, music, because the student they have now will be the new politician, will be the new leaders. So if I get them this knowledge, then that will be the new decision. So for that, I think I use uh, creativity in a, in a freedom, but at the same time, I give instruction so they can really get that knowledge. Can I also just say that you mentioned reading poems. Reading poems is also a creative activity. Criticizing yeah. is a creative activity. I'm a literary critic. I've been a literary critic yeah. for nearly 30 years. I've got my first book out in, you know, in a few weeks after being a critic for 30 years. Um, reading, criticism, all of this is creative as well. It's not just a doing. And just Mara. finally, don't think that you're learning will limit to your time in university. Mm -hmm. uh, I have learned more since I left uh, my yeah. education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, but my education gave me, like, like you say, gave me the different directions in which I could take my learning and open mm -hmm. different windows that maybe I wasn't aware. So don't despair because there are certain rules. Just, just know that this is only the beginning, that mm -hmm. they are showing you all the different paths paths for you to choose whilst you leave um, and that you will be learning all your life and probably a lot more than while you're in university. Mm -hmm. We've run out of time but we have more on this theme tomorrow so please come back here at 12.30 tomorrow to hear Alison Cole chair a panel with Michael Craig Martin, Tristram Hunt, Dr Brian Kennedy, Andrea Zafnik and Matthew Jesner. And it's been a really fascinating discussion. I am so grateful to Ron Alvarez, Julian Baggini, <laughs> Sarah Churchwell, Paul Griffiths, and Tamara Rojo. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you for teaching me how to conduct. Although, as I always do it now.